All right, hello, Mark Romero here. How are you today? Today I have a very special interview. I am so excited. Today my interview is with Maureen Whitehouse, and I wanna share a little bit about Maureen before we have her come in and start sharing, no pressure here, Maureen, about sharing <laughs> your wisdom, how we can help us to move forward and move past things and step into our next greater and grander expression, which of course this show is all about. But Maureen Whitehouse has been teaching and supporting individuals on their transfer formative journey since 1996 when she experienced a spiritual awakening precipitated by her intensive study of a course of miracles she is best known for her work as a counselor and a spiritual teacher helping those in the midst of their life's greatest pain to find complete inner peace and miraculous healing maureen is a sought after inspirational speaker an award-winning best-selling author the founder of the axiom institute which sounds really cool and has served as both a teaching fellow at the harvard divinity school and a research fellow at the world-renowned langer mindfulness lab maureen thank you so much for being here today i am so excited to dive into what I know is going to be a very inspiring conversation. So thank I'm you. I'm sure it is. You're, you're an inspiring host, that's for sure. And thank you. Thank I, you for inviting me. <laughs> I do my best. It's something I'm stepping into and discovering and unveiling on my journey, but so far so good. And plus I get to hang out with really cool people who have tremendous wisdom and insight, which is always exciting to me. So one of the, the, the first question I always like to ask is, you know, typically, and you mentioned it in your bio about the Course of Miracles, we have something we get exposed to, a life event, a circumstance that begins us on our path to stepping into what we're bringing forth today. And I'm curious what that was for you. Oh, interesting. I love that kind of segue into this. So I, um, my background is that I was a commercial actor and a model for many years, for a couple of decades by the time I wound up um, kind of more in a conducive environment to family life in Boston. I had worked in New York and Europe and all that kind of thing when I was younger. And then I was the quintessential mom in um, commercials and all those kinds of things, because I was good with kids and dogs. That was on my resume. <laughs> so I did a lot with. of that. <laughs> awesome. So I was at the point in my life where I was thinking, you know, there has to be more than this. I had been on commercial sets for the you know a couple of decades, worked with great stylists. My house was like a commercial set. I had the perfect family, the perfect dog could even be on commercials with me. And there was this nagging feeling of there has to be more than this, you know, that this is the American dream to the hilt. I've done all the glamorous stuff in, in that I felt, you know, in life. I got to this point that I just really felt there has to be more. And I used to kind of frequent in, even when I was in New York city, I'd go into like the backs of churches and just sit in quiet between auditions and, and things like that. And I found myself in a new age bookstore in a suburb right outside where the um, audition was in Boston. And I went in and I was looking at self-help books. And at this time, the self-help section wasn't that big, but I was like, read that, read that, know that power, positive thinking, all that. I'm like the poster girl for that. And then I turned and saw a book that was underneath like the window area of the shop. And it was kind of glowing at me and it was a little scary, but I went over, I picked it up. It was A Course in Miracles. Wow. It fell open to the page that said, "I." it's a lesson in A Course in Miracles. I am not a body. I am free for I am still as God created me. And I just like my mouth fell open and I started crying right in the store because that was me, I was a body. I was like a clothes hanger as a model. I was bite and smile in a commercial. I had the everything set up to be like, you know, this is what bodies do when they're in a perfect life. And I took it home, stuck it on the bookshelf, you know, and then I'd go for like nine months, I'd go by and say, I got to read that someday, not realizing what it was. But when I opened it up and I started reading it, I knew it was so important for me and impactful that I hid it under my couch. I kept it hidden and just between me and me worked 
the lessons of A Course in Miracles, they're 365 for like two and a half years. And every time I'd say something like, you know, today you are the light of the world. I'd, I'd really try with all of my heart and soul to be the light of the world. Of course, I'd get to like the end of the day and I'd be like, you stupid failure. I'm not Mother Teresa. And I'd be like, you know, have a rant that just blew everything of all the good, good things I'd done. But after that time of doing the lessons, A Course in Miracles, the path is forgiveness, but a different kind of forgiveness. It's that what if you were who you truly are? Would those circumstances have happened the way that they did? If you knew you were divine, if you knew you were all love, unconditional love, uh, the ray of the sun that came to earth, but is part of the divine light, would it have looked the way it did when you were engaged as a separate person, kind of trying to control or run things? And I got to the place where after those years, I realized I had forgiven every one in my life, you know, kind of not huge forgiveness pieces, but, you know, things that are significant to you that feel as though you were wronged or you have grievances, got through all of them. And then something dawned on me that was really kind of like a revelation at the time. Oh my God, there's one person left to forgive. I was the common denominator in all of those scenarios. Powerful. Yeah. I I got on my knees in my living room and I, the kids were at school and I was alone. And I just said, I forgive you, Maureen. And this sense of uh, elation came over me that I'll never have to do it that way again. Mm. That I, at the time, when I was doing the lessons of A Course in Miracles, I thought I was really stupid because they're a little bit lofty, not a little bit, they're lofty, the lessons, and trying to put them to practice. So I said at one point, I had known that the voice of The Course in Miracles is meant to be the voice of Jesus. And I said, if this is real, if this is real, you know, you better start teaching me here because I don't get this. I'm a hot mess still like getting more and more of a hot mess as I get more aware of what a hot mess I am. <laughs> and my judgment isn't going anywhere. My inner critic is like flaming. And, and I started to write what I was here feeling is how I'll put it. I was hearing it in my heart. It wasn't in my head. I was hearing a deep, uh, loving, caring presence. And as I wrote it, uh, I started to know it. You know, I I, I see that that kind of like resonated with you. There's a difference between intellect and spirit. Yes. I didn't know any of this at the time. But he said to me just before that, when I forgave everything, he said, now you're about to experience you read no. He said, you reached the chasm between my world and your own. You are now about to experience the great resolve. Mm. I never heard that before. Or And I was like, that's interesting, but I'm like in happy mode here because I forgave everything and I never have to do that again. I went, my husband was out of town. So I was a scared kind of person at the time. I had the kids in the bed with me, the dog perched the window, you know, the arms on and everything. And I would have had previously, I woke up at three o'clock in the morning. I looked at the clock. I woke up at three o'clock in the morning. If that was me in my normal life, I would have been so afraid that I woke up at three o'clock in the morning and couldn't get back to sleep, that I was up all night. And because my husband was out of town, instead, I looked at the clock and I said, well, I, I started to have some cramps in my stomach. And I said, well, I believe in miracles. Heal this. I went shooting out of my body and into what I could only describe as um, a soft white stillness. It was like being in a cloud of absolute unconditional love and embrace at, at one with what runs this absolute unconditional love. And I never imagined that it's, it's a, when, you can't, you can't uh, comprehend that because you're one with it. But I came down in layers through that, and 
as I came down in layers, had revelations along the way that were mind blowing and wound up when I said, there's no judgment here, because that shocked me. I grew up uh, Catholic, so I had learned that there was judgment to just God. Just a little, maybe just a little bit, right? Just a little judgment. <laughs> but there was literally nothing but absolute love, absolute love. Oh, so wow. when I said, there's no judgment here, I had a classic near-death experience where, guess who judged me? I saw all the places I had judged in my life. And what was interesting is that it was all the pain, all the pain. And it was a result of my judgment. I never knew that. I never knew that our pain is a result of our judgment you know, of ourselves and others. It's so interesting that you share this because I love that here you were doing the things that you thought you were supposed to do. That, you know, that, like. You know, I'm a former CEO, high tech guy. You know, it's like we think we're supposed to do this: get the job, get get your parts, get your things. You know, earn more money, buy, get, get your mother, money. father, do everything, and like buy the book, American Dream. Yeah. And then that discontent begins to grow. Really, fortunately, I, I it, yes. Well, <laughs> I, I think it's a now. force. It's a force that pushes us and moves us. And here you have this experience where the book's glowing at you. And even sits on your shelf for a while. I think we can all relate to that too. We get exposed to things. Yeah, I'll just kind of put it over here, and you know, you wouldn't. You know, I'll dive. You said into something that. really important about miracles in general. When people experience miracles, often they think, "Oh, that's weird. I'm not going to tell anybody about that," or they don't share them, which magnifies them in their life and makes them more commonplace. If you actually embrace them and acknowledge them, but. We instead love to share pain and problems and the mayhem and the drama so much that it sells newspapers and makes headlines and sells almost everything in life yeah. instead of really celebrating the, these amazing things like a book kind of glowing at me. But how do you articulate that, you know, in normal everyday life when you're it, especially not being especially not being looked at like, oh my gosh, Maureen's crazy. She's seeing glowing books now. <laughs> you know, I mean, <laughs> that's nothing and, compared to what happens next. So listen well, I, to, I know was, that's, that's amazing. Know, it is interesting because there's a place in A Course in Miracles where it says that as you advance on your journey in uh, spiritual realms, you will see, have things like episodes where there might be light, uh, episodes of light. And I didn't read the book yet, so I didn't know anything like that, that just was calling me to it to get me on the path. But so what happened after I had this near death experience and I saw all the pain that I had experienced in my life, the, I realized now after going to India several times and studying yogic texts and things, what had happened is I had an experience of what in the Hindu tradition they call Nivrakalpa Samadhi, where you're literally at one with the divine. In that state, it's not unusual. Uh, it's kind of unusual, but it's it's at least known in the Hindu tradition that you can be breathless for a, a long period of time. In this case, it was from three o'clock in the morning till 7.30 in the morning for me. When I woke up and I'm in, in a, like, what is happening? I'm on fire. And I look and see my kids next to me and realize I got to get them to school and things. I went into the bathroom to, to compose myself and splash water on my face. And when I came up into the mirror, I saw myself without a body. Wow. I saw myself as spirit. And I had the most riveting, unconditionally loving eyes that were like golden orbs looking at me with this knowledge of now you see how I see. And that's the, that was what the, the theme of the near-death experience. I heard a rolling thunderous chuckle the divine laughing. Now you see how I see. Now you see how I see. Now you see how I see. I wound up going through the next three days in that state where my mind was not there, except to navigate, like get the keys to go. I was in a state of absolute awe is what I'd say. You know, it, it's interesting. You said something, and this is amazing, 
this unfolding and this revelation. But you meant something about you were talking about how we as a society and as people, we focus so much of what's not working, the challenges in our lives, the drama, the fear, the worry. And, and yeah, we're bombarded by things that I, sometimes I say the world tries to keep us in this state to keep us disconnected from that experience, the type of experiences that you're sharing. But I was wondering, how do we open ourselves to seeing the miracles in our lives mm-hmm. when, especially when life has knocked us down, especially when we're in the midst of challenges? You know, let's face it, we all go through the twists and turns and the ups and downs of the human. Like we put those horse blinders on yeah. and we can only see a thing. Meanwhile, there's all these miracles happening around us. What you're describing as the horse blinders, what they are, just so that people know, because there's one problem, one solution. This is not that crazy, difficult to comprehend. The divine is there for us to see and experience always. What puts like a dark blanket or a black curtain between us and the divine and and seeing now you see how I see is judgment. I, I, I realized after that, that I I was just going down the aisle in the supermarket for an example. And I was in awe of, look at this in the supermarket aisle that came through, like someone had to think that up. Somebody had to cook that. Somebody had to package that. Somebody had to get that in a truck to get it here. How many people's lives are touching me now when I touch a box of spaghetti Mm -hmm. and All of that, like the capacity to recognize that we are always in a state of grace. And that might sound strange, but when you're really seeing the entire picture, like I was, as I picked up a greeting card, I saw the artist dropping her her son off at the bus to get to school before going to work. Because we have that capacity that we numb out, judgment is our vehicle for numbing us down. So we first and foremost judge ourselves. When I saw my life through the eyes of the divine, now you see how I see how I see, I realized that I was judging myself so harshly that in every circumstance I was called, and there were big painful experiences in my life, but I was called to transcend to what I really am, the creative that we are. You know this. You get out of your own way and you create beautiful music. So I have to ask you, why are we so hard on ourselves? Why is it? It's almost like I look at it as almost like there's been a frequency imprinted within all of us. The not enough, you know, right. and you talk about judgment. I always say, you know, I'm always talking about energy and flowing. I say, if you want to stop the flow of energy, you implement judgment because judgment is a resistor. You know, it's yeah. like putting a resistor on your circuit. Like a circuit breaker. Yeah. yeah. It slows and the flow of energy. It does. And the thing is, is that we are not afraid of things in life. We're afraid of our brilliance. Mm-hmm. Egos are afraid of our brilliance. They're afraid that we can literally, we have, we can solve any problem. We're genius. Even things that happen that seem formidable, like that's what the near death experience was. I, you know, things that I thought I didn't realize I was a control freak. How do you have fun and delight in life and have? I find that so hard to believe that you were ever a control freak. (laughs) Oh, uh, you know, I think it's the human condition because we think that's how we stay safe. Like I told you, I had the alarms on, the dogs at the window. I, I, I thought. I could keep myself safe while being disconnected from the voice of sanity. So what I tell people now is our our true nature, our inner being, is the voice of our own best interest. Mm. If we're annihilating that by thinking we're not good enough or having an argument with it, it loves us impeccably. Our true self knows who we are. I got to ask you the million dollar question then. Okay. So why do we have that part of us that okay, denies that part of us? Great question. The thing is, is we see it as this formidable opponent. This The whole Bhagavad Gita is the story between Krishna and Arjuna, and they're at the battlefield, but the battle's really inside of Arjuna and Krishna's God telling him, look, you're already God, you know? And and we can't see it because this part, this part of us, and okay, so I'm going to give you how A Course in Miracles frames it. 
It says that we're dreaming a dream, a mad dream, in which we're saying, I want it thus, the voice of separation. We did this as a joke. That was what I saw in the near-death experience. I saw myself, like, for instance, with my husband above it all saying, you pretend you're asleep now and I'll be awake and you and I'll be awake and you be asleep. We knew that we were going in to engage in things that would feel like conflict, but to choose only love. That's the reason we came here because when we're not in bodies, we know we're love. We know we're not separate from the divine. As soon as we slap on these physical forms and come here, especially as a vulnerable baby, we thought it was so much fun and so funny that we'd even make ourselves vulnerable as we pop in, live that out for decades, and then remember who we are. We thought it was a hoot, literally. We thought it was a joke. Yeah, we thought about that when we were up there with the five million mile high <laughs> Oh my gosh, this is going to be so great. Look, I'm so going to have fun. a dad that leaves home. I'm going to have a mom that tells me I'm not good enough. I'm going to have these, <laughs> you know, my my first girlfriend's going to run away with this person or whatever. All the, This is going to be great. And then we come down here and we're like going, what the hell was I thinking? Right. And I and, call and that then, the cosmic so game what, of hide and seek. And that's what happens. There you go. Perfect. Because then what happens is we are having this temper tantrum in which we say we want it this way and we're having a fight with ourselves because we forgot that we did this for fun because we know who we truly are. So the whole journey is to remember who we are and and fortunately one problem, one solution. We're divine and we forget in order to play out this fun and amazing, supposed to be fun and amazing scenario. But if we are in the throes of believing that this voice of separation, all the ego is, is it's not a form, formidable opponent. It's a voice that lets us feel separate from the divine. Oh, and, and here's the important thing to know about this ego. It always speaks first. Mm. So the reason why mindfulness practices and meditation help is because you're sitting back and observing thoughts. And if you get good at observing thoughts, instead of reacting, ego always speaks first. Think about every time you said something that was like, oh, why'd I say that? Why'd I do that? It's always because it jumps in and tells you how to stay separate, how to win, how you can get the upper hand. Whereas the voice of our true self, you know, when you are connected to it, because first of all, it feels like a big exhale and a relax. It's sort of like lean back, let it come forward and lead the way. The light's leading the way. You're not in the dark anymore. Here goes the light. You're just like, it's paved for you in miracles. And when you sit back and relax, you allow yourself to say, okay, maybe I don't know what this is, but I love it. See, a Course in Miracles makes it very simple. Again, one problem, one solution. You're divine and you forgot. If you're divine, then that means you're perfect. That means you're absolute, complete, and perfect. How do we remember that? We see everything as one of two things. Either love, which how fun, just love it, or a call for love. Mm. How fun, just love it. Now you're in the world of oneness where everything, and I will tell you, the way I see things now, um, when people talk about timelessness and things, if you see everything as one, if you see everything as either love or call for love, it it's framed differently. It's now, it, That's why the power of now and all those things are so effective, because if all you have to do is love, do you really need the voice of the ego telling you, go there, do this, make, make sure you get this, make sure you do that? You just know what's going to happen when you get there. You're going to love it. So, so let me ask you this, because this is something I think we all want to one degree or another. We want that oneness. We want that connection. We want to remember our magnificence and our unlimited potential. You mentioned judgment, but I'm kind of curious. What do you think is the biggest obstacle to us stepping into that? First of all, understanding that this was meant to be a joke. 
in in the course of miracles, it says it's a joke in which you forgot to laugh. <laughs> you don't know, laugh. It's just I have to say this because I talk about the cosmic game of hide and seek. We come in here with all our divinity, okay. all of our all of our grandeur. We promptly forget every single bit of it, and then we get to spend a lifetime re remembering it and experiencing it. And I remember I got this comment from somebody of a social media post or something saying, life is not a game, you know, it's not a game of hide and see, I'm offended, you know, and I'm like, going, well, you know, <laughs> hey, I've been offended a few times over the course of my journey and path. I understand that. And how's that working for you? How's that working <laughs> for you? The thing, another thing, of course, Miracle says is that we're having a temper tantrum in which we say we want it thus. And how's that going for you? It, it, you want to be right or you want to be happy? And if we are constantly the ego wants to be right at all costs it doesn't see well you know guess what there's different lenses on a camera and there's different facets to a diamond if it's going to be an amazing world full of diversity and wonderful things to enjoy and appreciate you got to have difference of opinions and different ways of seeing this and viewing this so how fun i don't know what your opinion is or what your view is let's share it win-win that's that's the divine way we're all here to enjoy and appreciate this as each individual piece of a puzzle, put them all together and the puzzle makes sense. All right. I'm not going to let you get away with the, <laughs> with the response here because you still didn't answer the question. Oh, good. I got What's that. the I biggest it. obstacle? I don't No politicians speak here. <laughs> okay. Hear. The biggest <laughs> what obstacle. Do you think it is? What do you think it is? It, it would be the ego, the voice that lets us feel separation. And yet... If we can see it as a little puppy, if we can see it as it's doing its job, it's trying to keep us alive. In its world, death is real. In its world, we're finite. In its world, you better fend for yourself and look, it's a crazy world out there. I'm going to take good care of you now, this little separate self. And you are separate from everything. There's no connection. There's no divine thread behind all of this. And so just do what I say and I'll keep you safe. It insists on running the show because it thinks it's keeping us safe. So mm -hmm. if we could stop fighting the ego and, and see ourselves as, come on, humans all need an ego because otherwise I wouldn't be able to be talking to you there and me being here. We right. wouldn't have this conversation. We'd just be in absolute bliss and oneness, like the experience of the utmost. Well, that sounds really good. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't it? Well, it, I think we all deserve to give ourselves tastes of that from time to time and then get our, you know, boots to the ground, kind of live life a, in a miraculous way. All right. But I have to, out I have every to so often and take a break. Yeah, right. And then also, it's like, let's face it, the ego gets a bad rap. There's a lot of negativity around the ego. Oh my God, the ego. But yet, we wouldn't be able to live without it. We wouldn't be able to have this experience. We wouldn't be able to play the game. Without. We wouldn't be at one with everything. And so, you know, talk about picking up an iPhone never could happen. Pick up a pen to write something never could happen. So if you can see it that way, then you can see this is a pretty ingenious scenario we created for ourselves. And we had to figure out some way to be able to forget enough to be able to captivate ourselves by a dream of separation. And so what better way than to create a voice and a physical a physicality that makes us feel as though we're separate. So one thing about that though, the one of the final things I did besides forgive everything is just shortly before that, say this is really intuitive of you to ask that one and most important thing about the ego being that the obstacle in the way. I had been fighting my ego. Once I read in A Course in Miracles that, you know, you have your divine self and your ego, I had been fighting it. And, you know, what we fight we, makes it stronger. And so I didn't realize that until I realized someone said, what are you fighting your ego for? And I said, well, I mean, I want to, I want to, I want to feel better. Well, it's not going to make you feel better. Think of it like a puppy. It's going around peeing in the corners and ripping up things that you chewing on your shoes. It's just a puppy. Yeah. I thought, Oh my gosh, what a, what a wonderful way to look at this. We've got this thing that's supposed to be thinking it's helping us. 
you know, puppies are only trying to have fun. They're only trying to do what a puppy does. Right. It's only doing what it does. So I realized then, well, I can enjoy having it because I'll just do the opposite of what it tells me to do. Okay. So yeah. interesting you bring this analogy of the puppy. Because I remember I was reading this piece. It came out of a book. The name will come to me. But it was a interesting combining Christian mysticism and Hinduism. And the analogy that he used about the mind and the ego was a person walking a puppy, a dog. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that dog is bouncing all over the place, going from place, sniffing this, pooping, peeing, doing all the things that puppies do, you know, and it's running the show. Right. It's, how can we, it's the person or the spirit that should really be running the show as opposed to the puppy. So how do we begin to, and I already kind of see a big answer to this question is suspending the judgment around the ego part because we do tend to be very judgmental i know a lot of people in the spiritual new age awareness group are very judgmental about the evils uh, the uh, the ego is bad or evil or whatever but yet it's a part that really i love that of viewing it as a untrained crazy puppy that just wants to jump around and keep us safe Mm -hmm. And as you also said, it affords us the experience of being a human. Mm -hmm. You know, the only problem that we have is that we forget we're a being. So we're a human being. And if we can default more often, you know, this is where consciousness comes in. We have free will. It's not free until we align it with the divine will, which is our perfect happiness. But we can do whatever we want to the add to the craziest man in the world, because this isn't all there is. That's the, that's when people always say, yeah, well, why would God let this happen? It's like the sun in the heavens sitting in sweet repose. The divine is, is all embracing, all loving, all perfect. Uh, we are that, but we're the ray of the sun. We come here, but we think when the clouds come, we're separate from the sun. We're not. We're touching the earth. We are here with these bodies to have our little heyday of fun separation so that we could co-create like the divine. See, we don't get to go back to our state or awaken or become enlightened until we admit that we are divine playing in these fakish facades at a game. Okay, so. How much that fun can you that, have with the game? Yes, but. It's very hard and I think very challenging for many of us to look at life, especially today. Look at the last three years, you know, with COVID and the yeah. stuff going on all over. It's almost like fear and disharmony are being perpetuated at higher levels than I can ever really remember. It's always been there. You know, because even when I was a kid, you know, it was the Russians and the Soviets and nuclear weapons. And, you know, it's all there's always been this aspect. But I think it's because of social media, because we're being bombarded 24 seven with negative images. You know, it's like, how do we find that place of uh, being at peace and wonder in this game that seems anything but a game what would you tell the person who's like going you know I'm, I'm so wrapped up in fear over the economy over you know the dollar over inflation over who's going to be president over who's fighting in the middle east or let's go to the ukraine or all these different things and it's like how do we get connected to that space of miracles that enlightened part of ourselves and begin to live from that space? Or here's really maybe the best question. How can we be in the world, but not of it? Perfect. Well, we actually know that we want to be in the world because think about it, how many people want to leave. They don't really want to die if they think that that's the only alternative. However, having had now the experience of being out of my body, I realize it's like taking off a tight shoe. It's like, whoa, you're now out of this constricted kind of mindset and physicality. But you, you ask the most important thing when, when we're here, if we can recognize that it's a dream, it's a dream of separation. It's an impossible dream. We cannot be separate from the divine. A Course in Miracles puts it this way. You have every capacity of the creator. 
as the child, holy child of the divine, you have every capacity of the creator except for one. You cannot recreate the creator. Mm -hmm. The creator will always be perfect love, will always be absolute, will always be unconditional, absolute embrace. So we can't stop that from being reality, but we can create any other crazy mayhem that we want. We and do. it's fine <laughs> because we can't recreate the creator. Love will always win. So in this world, think about it. If you had a nightmare, aren't you going to want to wake up a lot quicker? So we are riveted on pain, not because, you know, pain for pain's sake. We all know and come up with these creative ways to kind of transcend and come through pain, all these hospitals and, and, and professions that help us get over pain. But we are squeezing ourselves. We, we want to wake up. We came here to wake up from an impossible dream. All of us, not just one of us, all of us. I just so happened to have had the experience that I realized, oh, that's what we're doing here. But when you recognize that we came here to wake up, think about it. What's going to squeeze you down the smallest hole? Like the other thing about pain is it really focuses us. Look at humans all over, distraction everywhere. We literally wake up in the morning figuring how can we be distracted today most of the time. And we've it, done really good at that. Look at, I mean, we all have these little things. Oh right. my gosh, you Even know, better. Even, right. right. More distracted than ever. And so we don't focus easily as humans. And the thing that rivets us the most is pain. So it if we're really going to go, attention, that's for sure. If we're going to get to the other side and we realize, look, you know, kind of you're dreaming up. Now, this is very hard for people to hear. But since this is an impossible dream and you are highly creative, this is what I saw in the near-death experience. I knew how to push every button in myself. I knew exactly what and when and how would be a riveting pain for me. And I set that up for myself. We don't see that in this dream state. We know what's going to push our buttons and make us want to awaken. How much does it take to cry like uncle enough? When I found A Course in Miracles in the bookstore, I was saying enough. I, I feel empty. I, I've done enough of the performance part of things. I've done enough. I, I need to find another must be more than this. For all of us, there's more than this. There really is a truly divine way of being. Now, here's the kicker. Go for it. One thing the ego tells us is that if we were to wake up, it means certain death, annihilation. First of all, peace is not is not um, enticing to an ego. It's it equates it with like you know comatose, no capacity to do anything. So it's afraid of awakening. It's the voice of fear. The voice of separation is the voice of fear. You know, it's so interesting you say that because what you just said right now is the reason why it is so hard for many of us to meditate and quiet yeah. the mind because the mind's like going, hell no, we're not going there. I'm going to keep throwing thoughts at you because I don't want you to get, because I'm afraid we're going to get annihilated. I mean, <laughs> could you really come up with a better excuse to not be meditate, not be in a state of mindfulness? <laughs> right. You know, so... so you use this term. It catastrophizes everything too. So just know that, that if it's a small, it could be like, oh, you know, you put that wrong place on the table. Why did you put that on my table that way? It catastrophizes everything. So I have to ask this because I, I was reading over your material, you know, and you have this beautiful term. And it seems anything but this, though, especially after what we we're talking about, this this <laughs> wonderful ego part of us that's so masterfully, you know, an integrative part of the cosmic game of hide and seek. But you talk about effortless enlightenment. Yeah. It seems like it's not effortless. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what Again, is your definition of effortless enlightenment? The, my definition of effortless enlightenment is we all, there's a part of us, the the vast part of us that's already there, that already abides in perfect 
peace and absolute awareness in genius and grace and everything we've always wanted. And it's a small, still voice that calls us home until we start to pay attention to it. It's not, a. it's what, um, you know, we used to think that this was our conscience yeah. and, and that there was another, you know, telling us good from bad. The the divine of us doesn't care about good and bad. It knows who you are. It knows you're inherently perfect. What good and bad? That's the world of this and that. That's the world of you there, me here, bodies and and egos. If you are in that place where you start to realize that there's only one thing going on and it's all happening for you, not to you. Right. And you pay attention to why would that show up at this time in my life? Like, what's the, is there a genius behind this that really knows how to get under my skin right then, right there when I could choose love and I'll be damned if I'll choose love now. And that very thing that causes us the most pain is actually the exact pinpoint, the exact window to go in to be able to unravel that, to find your true self. Mm -hmm. And, and, and we don't see that because we are so adverse to pain. We try to numb it. We try to hide it. We try to fix it. We try to change it instead <laughs> of saying, wow, what about if that was the doorway to consciousness for me? Doorway out the other side to who I really am. I have to tell you that maybe people, um, just, to, just to get the ego off the front burner here, I've been living this way of seeing perfection for Almost for over well, 27 years now, a couple of weeks ago, 27 years that I woke up. And it's a hundred percent. You know, I I have not shunned or been reticent in life or hole up in a cave. I worked in maximum security prisons, I've worked in schools with kids killing each other, I've been in hospital where people are, you know, dying. I've I've went into the thick of life to see, is this everywhere always? And it is mm-hmm. that. If we can hold the space of absolute unconditional love, like that's who we really are. We are absolute unconditional love. That means no condition at all that's in this world of form is going to stop us from loving. Mm -hmm. And if we can stay there in that loving space, and here's the way to do it. I'm going to give a little mantra that I That's good because I was just going to ask you what's (laughs) like the one, what one, you know, obviously there's probably multiple steps to this. And this know, one's like, really, really helpful. Okay, uh, let's hear it. I want to hear it. I'm taking notes. <laughs> Here's your mantra. Here's your okay. new mantra. And whenever you feel that there's a way for discontent or anything to arise that could feel like judgment, I don't know what this is, but I love it. Mm. You have to like, because you guess what? The ego always knows what it is. I know what that is. That guy cut me off in traffic. I know what this is. And I know what that is. I need this to be put over here and not there. If you say, I don't know what this is and don't fill it with, but I love it. The ego is going to say, no, I do know what this is. (laughs) So you have to say, I don't know what this is, but I love it. Now take a, a master, like somebody like Jesus or somebody like Buddha, the awakened Buddha, when they show up to anything, they don't know what it is, which gives you a much more expansive capacity. If you don't use your intellect to know what it is, I don't know what this is, but what was their first impulse? They're going to love, what are they going to do? Anything but love it? Right. Are they ever going to do anything but love it? So people say they want to be like Jesus. They want to be like Buddha. In A Course in Miracles, it says, everyone says they want peace, but very few people mean it. Mm. If you really wanted peace, you've got to want to be happy rather than right. And no one else can make you happy. No other scenario can allow for your happiness because you can make anything a problem, even if it's the most beautiful experience in the world. Isn't that for sure? Yeah. Yeah. So all of this, when I say effortless enlightenment, I don't mean that it's effortless to an ego that will want to fight this <laughs> to the death, literally to the death, to the death. People wind up on their deathbed. You know, Helen Shuckman, who was the scribe for A Course in Miracles, it was kind of an interesting story. She was a psychology professor at um, 
in at Columbia University. And she was her and the head of the department had this little like pact where she said to him, I think I'm psychotic. I'm hearing voices. And he said, well, you know, I'm the head of the psychology department at Columbia at the time was the foremost place in, in for psychology. And he said, well, write it down. Tell me what you hear. And I'll tell you if you're psychotic. And so she wrote it down and he said, this is not psychotic. So for seven years, they she scribed saying the voice was Jesus and she was an atheist and was Jewish and did not like this at all. And at one point, he she said, why am I, why am I doing this? He said, because you'll do it. You'll, I know you'll do it. You'll complete it. You'll finish it. And they did. She didn't want anything to do with it, but they gave one of the most powerful teachings that's ever been on earth. And I know it's real because of my experiences. I would never have spoken about this. I would have probably been doing still bite and smiles on commercials <laughs> 12, 30 years later. But I, I know this for a fact after being in the trenches with people all this time, that miracles are imminent. They are right there side by side. And just to put it clearly, you're a miracle. We're a miracle. When you were born, you came in here and everyone celebrated. You're a miracle. You came in with your first breath. That's invisible. That's mm -hmm. spirit. Every day, all day, it animates us. Spirit, invisible. It's unconditionally supportive. It's right. It's there for us always, and you'll leave with your last. And that is the eternal nature of us. If nothing more in all of everything I said, if you remember two things, breathe, just breathe. And when you breathe, just let yourself connect with that deeper essence of this is what came in, the perfection of me, breathes me and supports me all day, every day, and allows me to experience this world of this and that, even if it's ego oriented or insane or crazy. And I'll leave with my last, but I doesn't stop. There's the, and then there's this, you'll always be eternal does not end ever. There is no death. You know, it's as you were sharing that it's like, it reminds me of a book I read years ago by Ogmandino, the greatest miracle in the world. And he talks about, I whispered this in your ear when you were born. You're the mm -hmm. greatest miracle in the world. And you cry. They all cry. You know, you're yeah. the greatest miracle in the world. You know, of all the 40 billion people that have walked the planet, there's only been one of you. Even things that we consider precious, like Stradivarius violins and Van Goghs, there's more than one of those, but there's only one of you. And, and the things you touch and, and every day it morphs into new opportunities and new ways to expand. And the thing is, is that I realized all of pain was us having this temper tantrum where we close down instead of expand into something more, the something more we all want to know and be. But then we look for all these other answers in this world of, you know, the, the dream instead of going in and just breathing and and stopping, just stopping long enough for this voice of our own best interest to start to speak to us. And I, I wanted to say something about that too. You will never ever hear a voice that's more precious or profound or impactful than your own true voice, because it's 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 speaking to wake you up to who you really are. It already knows. It hasn't forgotten. It's home. It's fullness. It's complete completion. It's the essence of perfection. And it's you. So when we touch that, it's it reminds us of the miracle that we already are. That's awesome. That's beautiful. So I have to ask this because obviously we could just keep going down this path, I think for maybe a couple more hours and stuff. <laughs> you know, I love this. This was, you know, in our previous conversations, I could just give, dive into this all day long, you know, and you know, how do we reveal this divine masterpiece that's within this and live from that place? But how can people find out more about you? You know, what it is that you offer? What's the best way to get connected with you? Social media, website, all that okay. good stuff. Yeah. I, you have a free gift you want to share. 
Yeah. So a few things. Um, I have a podcast called Miracle Renegade because I believe that we're all miracle renegades in the making. Uh, What a wonderful world this would be if everyone owned their true miraculous nature and knew that you're here to wake up now and to wake up the world in the best, most amazing creative ways like you, Mark. We all have a creative capacity that's genius. We can create our way out of anything. Anything we can dream up, we can create our way out of it. And that's the essence of effortless enlightenment, that when we realize our creative nature and our miraculous nature, then we automatically default to who we truly are. And we already are awake. We already are enlightened. So um, I have that Miracle Renegade podcast, morningwhitehouse.com easy spelled just white house just like it's spelled sounds um morningwhitehouse.com i have a free gift for everyone here that kind of goes into this a little more it's a it's a micro teaching and then an accompanying pdf workbook it's called from pain to power that's from pain to the the um to power.com and then um this this course that's my signature course that I got as a download I used to walk the beach every morning at sunrise I lived on the ocean something I manifested miraculously and um I I asked how's the best way to impart what I've been doing with people for the last 10 years that helps them get immediately out of pain and I had a vision and saw this triad miracle mindedness miracle matrixing and miracle mastery, three phases that you shift your mind to to see the miracles inherent in life. And they are there. I promise you, I've been using this methodology for the last 20 years with people, helps them immediately shift into a miraculous perception. But then that's not enough. Once you shift your mind, it's important to live it, to know it. So living this new way of seeing and being is miracle matrixing. And then that starts you knowing in your own personal firsthand experiences that miracles are real because you're living them all day. And then miracle mastery in A Course in Miracles, it says that we only keep the most important things by giving them away. So you have love, you get more love by giving it away. You have peace, you get more peace by giving it away. You have joy, you get more joy by giving away. The most important things in life we keep when we give them and have more of them when we give them. So Miracle Mastery teaches that phase about when it's appropriate to begin to share and give instead of giving away too soon. Often we give away too soon because we don't think we're worthy or things and then we don't get a chance to matrix this fully so that's effortless enlightenment but you'll find out more about that too from all of well thank you so much for sharing and shining your light and inspiring me and i know all of us to continue this process of unveiling the masterpiece that's within each and every one of us it's a journey and it's nice to know that there's an effortless component there that we don't have to go through drudgery unless we choose to of course well, think about yeah. this though for a moment let's just use you as the example of effortlessness oh think no about the times <laughs> when you but think about this because you're the masterpiece you know that's creating masterpieces here that's what we came to do and it could look like a crazy mayhem like a horror film or it could look like a beautiful awakening and awareness to things that are something more the something more that's more fulfilling but think about this yourself mark when you've created the most beautiful pieces that you've created wasn't that just you in connection rather than disconnect the voice of separation wasn't taking control it was you in connection so effortless enlightenment is us in a state of connectivity to who we already are that's why it's effortless we get out of our own way and we just relax into ourselves. You get it, you know it, you've lived it. Now it's just, we get more and more practice. The more we do the what we came here to be, the more you live that unapologetically and don't care about the good or bad opinions of other people, right. then the more it just becomes natural and effortless for you. That's excellent. I love it. So once again, I invite you to go 
to from pain the number two power.com and uh, make sure you tap into that and google i'm sure or go to maureenwhitehouse.com learn more about what this beautiful soul this beautiful person is bringing forward to help and inspire us all on this journey on i sometimes call it mr toad's wild ride there's this i don't know if you've ever been to disneyland here in <laughs> southern california but there's this ride called Mr. Toad's Wild Ride, which is you going around and around and around and around. There rises every kid that ever goes on it. You know, it's like I remember my daughter thinking that she was actually had to drive the car, you know, so she was like she needed to go to therapy after that ride. But sometimes that's what sometimes the human experience feels like Mr. Toad's Wild Ride. But it's so nice that we have people like yourself that come and bring forth such wonderful information and experience and insight and heart energy to help inspire us all to better manage the ride and realize um, just let go and see yeah. what happens for you. So thank you. And so two takeaways, the two most important takeaways to get off Mr. Toad's Wild Ride. I don't know what this is, but I love it. I like that. And just breathe, connect to your breath. And those are the windows that get you right there, right now into that space where you're aligned with who you truly are, connected to who you truly are. Beautiful. Well said. Thank you so very much for being here and thank uh, you, Mark. <laughs> taking really. the time to join us today. Take care. All right, everybody, I invite you once again to go from pain, the number two power.com. Check it out, get your download, dive more into this and uh, see what can open up for you as you begin to unveil more of this beautiful one of a kind masterpiece that's within each and every one of us. Take care and have a harmonious day. Thank you.